Greetings from Phoenix, Arizona. This is Tony E. Denton coming to you from my office. Let's talk a little bit about 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, through chapter 3, verse 2. The focus of this study is actually going to be verse 2 of chapter 3, where it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. The world doesn't know us as such because it doesn't know Him. It goes on to say, Beloved, though we are now the children of God, what we shall be hasn't yet been manifested, but we've known that when He's revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. I think that's actually verses 1 and 2, um, but verse 2 is going to be our primary focus. And this verse is of no little dispute among Bible students. Though it may have actually been clear to the original recipients of this letter, the same sadly just cannot be said today. In my estimation, the only way to unearth as closely as possible what John had in mind when he penned this declaration is to consider its immediate context beginning at least as far back as chapter 2, verse 28, and continuing through chapter 3, verse 12. So with that said, and since I obviously can't do justice in one study to all 14 verses, I'll have to skim over some clauses and phrases in this passage that aren't absolutely pertinent to our acquisition of John's intended meaning in verse 2. Well, let's go back now and let's read verses 28 and 29 of 1 John chapter 2, that kind of leads us into chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be shamed away from him at his presence. Since you know he is righteous, you know that everyone practicing righteousness has been born of him. In other New Testament letters, we learned that the first generation church had dealt with attacks from without and from within. Besides being persecuted physically, even to the point of martyrdom, she was troubled mentally by professed prophets who taught lies about Jesus and his disciples. Then to top it off, her ranks were infiltrated by folks Paul called false brethren, who weren't only slipping in counterfeit doctrine, but even teachings which intended to lead Christians off into immoral lifestyles. Just read Second Peter chapter 2 and the book of Jude, and you'll see what I'm talking about. So those to whom John penned 1 John were Christians who had to deal with some of the same things. They had to deal with Antichrist from without, chapter 2, 18, and 4, verses 1 and following. They had to deal with subversives from within, chapter 2, 19. And of course, they had to deal with the horrific mess those infiltrators would leave behind, such as, number one, problems related to their teaching that the Messiah hadn't yet come the first time, much less the second. Number two, hateful treatment of one another. And number three, just general wickedness in their lives. So, as with nearly Every letter in the New Testament, this one, 1 John, was penned to encourage those who were going through these very confusing and difficult times, which is why verse 28 begins with a charge to remain steadfast in Christ in order to have confidence instead of being shamed away from him at his presence. Since the same ideas and words were used for confidence and shame, in the Greek version of Proverbs 13, verse 5, John may very well have had this saying of Solomon in mind. An ungodly man is ashamed and will have no confidence. See, at least in the context of 1 John, to abide in Christ and God is clearly a way of saying to not live in an ungodly or unrighteous manner. For the very next statement is this, since you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone practicing righteousness has been born of him. And then in chapter 3, verse 10, he said it in the negative. Everyone not practicing righteousness is not born of God. So you kind of had the bookends there. But we'll get more into the righteousness business a little bit later. For now, let's consider John's statement to abide in Christ so that we, quote-unquote, may have boldness at his appearance. 
Let's focus on John's first person pronoun, we, here for a moment. Speaking of their world, John had just said a few verses earlier that at the time he wrote, around AD 65, it was in the process of passing away. What was their world? Speaking of their world, around AD 65, it was in a process of passing away, 1 John 2, 17. In fact, due to all that was transpiring at the time, including the presence of the Antichrist, no less, he even went on to say twice in verse 18, it is the last hour. Now, speaking of this Antichrist stuff, you will probably want to go back and see my notes or listen to the audio of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 on a site for the Lord dot com. And it's also in book form in my book, Pertinent Parasy of Passages. Um, I don't go into a real lengthy depth of it, but it's very interesting. The correspondence between or the parallel between 1 John 2 and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Anyway, so do we really believe it was a mere fluke that John led them from there in verse 18 of chapter 2, 17 and 18, right into a discussion of the Lord's return? He talked about the passing away of the world and the Antichrist in verses 17 and 18 in chapter 2, and then the Lord's return in 28 through 3 and 2. Surely that's not a fluke. With that, and John's choice of the first person pronoun, we, that is John and those of his time, in verse 28, in mind, recall that even Jesus himself indicated that John could in fact live until his return. What, you say? <laughs> Well, after Jesus told Peter about his future death for him, Peter then asked, What about John? To which Jesus said, If I'd like for John to remain until I come, what's that to you? So the word spread around that John wasn't going to die, even though Jesus didn't say he wasn't going to die, but that if I'd like for him to remain till I come. That's all found in the Gospel of John, Chapter 21, verses 21 through 23. So yes, John could and did choose the first person pronoun we in 1 John 2, 28, because he very well could have lived till the return of the Lord. Is he 2,000 years old? No. We're talking about the return of the Lord for those who were then alive, which also fits something else Jesus said. Jesus did say to John and several other disciples that he'd return with angels in judgment and his kingdom before all of them had died, Matthew 16, 27, and 28. And I have an entire study just on those two verses, Matthew 16, 27, and 28, in both note form and audio form on my website, as well as in my book, Pertinent Parasy of Passages. So, if you are being taken aback right here at the beginning of this study on 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, I ask you to perhaps pause this and then go check out that study on Matthew 16, and maybe even others that would help with this. But this study on 1 John 3, verse 2, is based around the concept that Jesus' return actually was fulfilled around the time of the events of AD 70, when Jesus came to reject his rejectors and accept his acceptors. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along here, but you'll find a lot more about it in other studies like Matthew 16. So anyway, moving on. Concerning the word translated appears in 1 John 2.28 here, Marvin R. Vincent, after citing several passages in which it's found, said in his word studies of the New Testament that the meaning is much deeper than merely an appeal to the sense of sight. He said that it addresses spiritual perception and contemplates a moral and spiritual effect. That's from his notes on John 21, verse 1. Now, since this is a passive word, a better translation would be 
when he shall be manifested. A word which, according to Joseph H. Thayer in his Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament, could mean either made visible or made known or both. Concerning the word parousia, which is translated coming here in 1 John, Vincent said that it literally means presence. And I talk about that also at length in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 8 study. He said it means presence. Thus, the consequential arrival of one who was in the process of coming. So, appears means manifested. Parousia means presence, the result of the coming. W. Vine, in his Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, notes that parousia is from para, which means with, and usia from emi, which means to be. Thus, to be with, or to be in the presence of. Therefore, to summarize, John was saying in 1 John 2, 28 and 29, let's all abide in Christ, that is, live godly and righteously, verse 29, so that when he appears, or when he is manifested, we may have confidence in his presence. So let's go on now to chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. The world doesn't know us as such because it doesn't know Him. Beloved, though we are now the children of God, what we shall be hasn't yet been manifested. But we've known that when He's revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. So, we've now come to a spot that brings us back to something I brought up earlier. Moments ago, referring to chapter 2, verse 19 of 1 John, I mentioned the subversives. Who were these infiltrators? Or more to the point of John's writings, who were those troubling these disciples of Christ? Who were those who left their Christian ranks because they were never truly Christian? Right, the Hebrew people who rejected Jesus as the Messiah. They were called Judaizers. See, when John wrote during the transition between Pentecost of Acts 2 and Holocaust of AD 70, between the departure and the return of Jesus, there was an extreme disagreement concerning who exactly were the children of God. The majority Israelites who rejected Jesus, or the minority Israelites who accepted Jesus. Well, we know today the truth of that which John was reassuring these disciples, that is, that the minority, or the remnant, were God's true children. That fact just needed to be made known, manifested, or revealed for all of them to witness at the promised demise of Jerusalem with its temple by Jesus through the Romans. This very same issue was what Paul was dealing with in Romans 8, 16 through 18. Just as John here in chapter 2, 20 through 21 brought up the Spirit in connection with this, so Paul wrote, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we, that is the remnant, or what he called in verse 23, the first fruits, are the children of God. And since we're his children, then we're also heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, since we're suffering together with him, that we may also be glorified together with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is about to be revealed in us. Well, wow. Romans 8, 16 through 18 is a tremendous parallel with 1 John 2, 20 through 3 and verse 2. Note how Paul in Romans 8 emphasized glory and glorification. Those who believed in Jesus as the Christ were chosen to be God's real children. And what's real to God is that which is spiritual and eternal, not that which is material and temporal. And being joint heirs to the glory of Christ, they'd logically be glorified with him, like Second Thessalonians chapter 1 speaks about. Listen to Paul again. These, those who rejected Jesus as Messiah, shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, which corresponds to being shamed from his presence in 1 John 2.28, and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints. That's 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 9 and 10, which corresponds well 
with Colossians 3 verse 4, where Paul also said, when Christ appears, then we also will appear with him in glory. Likewise, in Philippians, Paul wrote that our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for the Savior who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. Chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. What's even more interesting about Philippians 3 is that it's all about Christ imputing his righteousness to his bride body, verse 9, in order that she might be made fit for him, the groom. And I have an entire study on Philippians chapter 3 as well on my website, a site for the Lord.com, Philippians chapter 3, both in note form and audio form. Now, why is this interesting about the bride body being made fit for him in Philippians 3? Because I believe that was the primary thing John had in mind when he was writing our text under consideration. That is, while according to 1 John 2, 28 through 29, they were to do as Paul taught in Romans 13, 13 and act like they were already accredited with Christ's holiness, they would be greatly anticipating the fulfillment of the imminent hope of being glorified with him in his perfect righteousness, which would in turn, of course, vindicate the Christians as God's true children or the new covenant spouse of the Christ. Consider prophecy for a moment. In Hosea 2.19, God had said, I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me in righteousness. So then later in chapter 10, verse 12 of Hosea, and according to what John and Paul both wrote, he went on to say, God did in Hosea 10 and 12, sow for yourselves righteousness Reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness upon you. See, they have not yet received the righteousness of Christ, even by the time John wrote in A.D. 65. He had not come and given it to them yet. That's why in places like Romans 4.23, Galatians 4 and 5, it speaks about the hope of righteousness for them. Well, you think they already have it? No, not yet. The Lord had to return from out of the most holy place with salvation and righteousness to give to them. But before he did that, they were still being told to act like they already had received it to be righteous, to do all they could, to act and live righteously. That's not only spoken of here in 1 John, but also in many of Paul's writings and even indicated in Hosea 2.19 and 10 and verse 12, where God said, sow righteousness until the Lord rains righteousness upon you. See, those of John's world didn't know, and thus wouldn't acknowledge, that Christians were the true children or spouse of God because they didn't really know God. That is, the Jews, all the Hebrew people, all the Israelites of John's world is who he's talking about. As with Saul before he became Paul, Acts 23, 1 and Acts 26, 9, the Christ-rejecting Jews thought they knew God. Those of that world that was passing away, thought they knew God. But they were, very sadly, mistaken. They were not those working the righteousness of God. They were working out their own righteousness and missing out, according to Paul in Romans 10, on the righteousness of God. So John was telling these folks, Listen, brethren, you've accepted Jesus, the Christ, and he's going to come and give you righteousness, but you need to be acting as if you already have it. Again, Romans 13, 11 and following. So, what did John mean when he said that they'd become like him because they'd see him as he is? Well, out of the two groups fighting over who were God's true children, which group ended up being those who saw God and Christ face to face when the second coming occurred in order to finalize the fulfillment of all prophecy, thereby creating the perfect 
that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians 13, 10 through 12? Right. Christians. Christians were the ones who got to see God face to face. The face to face relationship. They were the ones who got to enjoy that. To see that. Physically? Literally? No. It's a relationship concept. Christ, when he came, rejected the rejectors, burned their city and their temple. But he accepted the acceptors. They got to have the face-to-face relationship. They were the ones who got to enjoy that as the bride of Christ. By having the Christ's righteousness imputed to them, that which they were waiting and hoping for, Galatians 5, verse 5. I think I said the wrong verse earlier. I think I said Galatians 4, 5. They were the ones who were placed into a face-to-face fellowship, a consummated relationship with their Creator. Paul wrote of them at that time in 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve that although they saw, that is, understood, that all things would be fulfilled in the Lord Jesus upon His return, It would only be then that they'd see face to face. So for them to see him as he is, meant for them to see him, this Jesus of Nazareth that the others had rejected, as the fulfillment of the true everlasting righteousness that was prophesied in Daniel 9.24, 500 years earlier. Think about that. Daniel 9.24 prophesied of the righteousness that Jesus would bring. Jesus did not come back with that righteousness in its fullness to give to his brethren. Hebrews 2, 10 and 11. Then we don't have righteousness today. And by the way, speaking of this face-to-face relationship that was created through the giving of Christ's righteousness, that's talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8 through 12. You can find an entire study of mine on that passage, also on a site for the Lord.com, also in note form, audio form, and as well in my book, Pertinent Parousia Passages, along with Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, which fits in here as well. See, all of those of their world and their time that is, of John's world and John's time, would see the Lord in some respect or other, such as their judge at his return, but only Christians would be given the privilege of seeing him in a face-to-face, reconciled relationship. Yes, again, they'd all see him in some way, in some fashion, but only the Christians would be granted the righteousness of Christ, thereby creating that face-to-face reconciled relationship. Because they were given that privilege, they were given that privilege of that face-to-face reconciled relationship. Because of that, they were in turn glorified with the Lord and His perfect righteousness, binding them to Him and their Father Yahweh to the point that He could then live in them as His temple, which brings up John chapter 14, Verses 1 through 3, and then verses later, around 18 and 23. This whole business of Jesus returning to them, for them, as his bride, giving them his righteousness, and then he and his Father coming to live with them, like Revelation 21 talks about. The Father coming down from heaven to them, creating that union of which you and I today are children, that wedded union. So they, our first generation brethren, the bride of Christ, became the temple. As Jesus himself said in Matthew 13, 43, it was then that the righteous would shine forth in the kingdom of their father. Yes, all the blessings of that incident accrue to us today. But we're focusing on what was happening then with them during the time of writings like 1 John chapters 2 and 3. And by the way, this statement of Jesus in Matthew 13, 43 that I just mentioned is what's 
in what's known as the parable of the terrors of the field, on which I also have a study on my website, is an echo of Daniel 12, verse 3. Permit me to camp here for just a moment. In the previous verse, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it speaks of the time of the dispensing of resurrection life, an event per verse 7, placed, by the way, at the time of the demise of Jerusalem and Judaism. Now, I bring this up because the shining forth of the righteous in the kingdom is directly connected to the time of the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, the resurrection chapter of Paul, has a lot of information that corresponds to 1 John. He said in 1 Corinthians 15, 34, to awake to righteousness and don't sin. For some don't have the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. That verse by itself, which is pretty close to the middle of the whole chapter, bespeaks 1 John 2, 28 through 3 and 12. You just can't get much closer to saying the same thing. 1 Corinthians 15.34 is almost like a one-sentence encapsulation of 1 John 2.28 through 1 John 3.12. This verse by Paul is like a summary. Well, besides all this and so much more that could be mentioned and said in reference to 1 John chapters 2 and 3, it seems impossible to me to think that John did not have Psalm 17, 15 in mind. David said to Yahweh, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Wow. Just think about that verse. How that it's almost impossible that John did not have that in mind when he wrote that section that we're looking at. And John didn't leave his readers in the dark concerning the character and nature of Jesus even before his return. For in the general context that we read at the beginning, we found John emphasizing what Jesus was like at the time he was writing. After writing in chapter 3, verse 2 about Jesus as he is, in verse 3, he said that Jesus is pure. In verse 5, he said that Jesus is sinless. In chapter 2, 29, and chapter 3, verse 7, he bookended the entire section by plainly stating that Jesus is righteous. Before he returned, when he returned, and so on. But his righteousness was not imputed to them until his return, according to Daniel 9, 24, as well as the text of 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, and the surrounding verses that we've just read especially down through verse 12. So when they, in just a few years, reached that point in time when they saw him as he was even before he arrived, that scene of him would be in a face-to-face -face relationship because they then saw him in their Christ-imputed righteousness state along with him, thus being glorified together in that manner with him. Now, this is a very difficult passage, and you may have to listen to this talk or go through my notes on this two or three times to get it all, but it's really cool because it's all about righteousness and when that righteousness was imputed to them so that they would be like him and thereby creating the union between him and his bride, the groom and the bride, Jesus and the church, a union that was created, a family that was created, of which you and I are today children. Well, let's end with one quick question or answer to a question. So what did John mean by what we shall be has not yet been manifested? Well, that's reminiscent to me of Paul in Philippians 3 again, where he said, not that have already attained to resurrection life, that was the context, or am already perfected. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Jesus has laid hold of me. Thank you for your time.